Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the world's first and only live jiu-jitsu show. Brought to you by Defense Soap, defend what you have built, and Q5 Labs, stay alpha. And here's your host, Budo Jake. Hey guys, welcome back to This Week in BJJ. I want to thank Javi Vasquez for coming on the show today. Thank you, Javi. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. We got lots of stuff to talk about. I want to talk about your school. I want to talk about the curriculum at the school. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that you have a, a match coming up against Gary Tonin. But first of all, I want to talk about you joining the Gracie family. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that a scary prospect or something that you were excited about? How and how did that happen? Um, well, well, yeah. I mean, um, I met I met Rose uh, at a mutual friend's birthday party, so it was very casual. And um, she doesn't like to tell me the story this way, but I'll tell it the way I, I saw it. She stalked me for for a week <laughs> until I went out with her. So we went out and, and basically have never separated since. Um, and I always, you know, a lot of people have asked me similar, you know, oh, were you excited? I, I never really thought of it that way. I just thought of it as, you know, that, you know, I, I love Rose and I want to be with her. And it just so happens that, that she was in this family. And, and we had a lot of things in common because, you know, I was already a black belt. I already had my own academy. I was already doing my own thing. And, um, you know, I had been a black belt like maybe maybe two years, something like that, um, when, I, when I met her. And I thought I knew a lot, you know. And, and the longer I do this, and especially working with uh, her brothers, Hedon and Henner and Halleck even also at the time, um, I started to quickly realize that I didn't know a whole lot about about anything, and, and my game was very um, specialized. Even though I was fighting, and I did know a little bit more about quote unquote self defense because I was you know having to deal with strikes and clinching and things of that nature, I started to realize that my jujitsu had a lot of holes that I had to plug, and 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 they and they over the years have helped me plug a lot of those holes. Do your brother in laws charge you for those private lessons? <laughs> um, I, I feel very privileged. I'm in a very privileged position to where, um, no, they have not ever charged me for anything. They've they've been very open with their knowledge. They've been very open with their time. And they've been, always been nothing but helpful to me if I called them. And I just I just called Henner on whatever, last week. And I'm like, can you train? And he goes, yeah, come in whenever. You know? And anything I've ever asked them, they've always you know helped me. A lot of jiu-jitsu nerds like myself um, go to family reunions and probably don't have a lot to talk about because, <laughs> you know, things like jiu-jitsu are always on my mind, but none of my family members train. Mm -hmm. um, how is it when you go to family reunions? Is, it, is all the conversation about jiu-jitsu? No, not at all. Um, it's actually quite the opposite. We don't really discuss it a whole lot. You know, we're talking about the kids or what they're doing. It's, it's actually kind of um, completely the opposite <laughs> as, as far as I've seen, you know. You know, I'm looking at your uh, your ring finger, and I see you have a tattoo. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure I have an idea of why, but can you uh, tell me why you have a tattoo? There? Well, she tied me up, and no, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, we just, I, I don't like to wear rings. I don't like to wear, generally, I don't wear watches or rings. And because of training, um, you know, I, I didn't think that a ring was necessarily a really good idea. You know how some people put it on, they never take it off. I don't necessarily think that's a good idea for training because it can get caught in a gi and it can get ripped and you can get you can get injured. So, um, and Rose doesn't like to wear rings either, so we decided to get tattoos, matching tattoos. And um, it works for me. I, I, I like it a lot yeah. better. I feel a lot more free as far as, you know, not having the restriction of the ring. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. I yeah. had the longtime viewers of the show might remember that I sprained my finger um, years back and had to get my ring cut off. Right. So since then, I haven't had it. But uh, a tattoo is something that I've thought yeah. about as well. Great idea for practitioners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I don't know if it was true or not, but I did see um, – a picture once where the guy's gi got caught and it kind of ripped it. I don't know if it, if it was true or manufactured or whatever, but right. I didn't want to take that chance regardless. So That's right. I'm right there with you. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your academy. Uh, you have a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu school in Rancho Cucamonga. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just looked at the website this morning and the tagline is strike based jujitsu. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, um, my whole concept at that academy and the number one rule that we have is don't get hit. Because as long as you're not getting hit and taking damage, you're still in the fight. You're at the very least defending yourself. And I've taken all of my years of MMA and having to deal with, you know, the best guys in the world trying to hit me. 
that I kind of developed a system, a systematic way to defend yourself from any position from the bottom or whatever, uh, you know, any position in general, top guard, um, bottom guard, um, side my top, side my bottom, um, guard, top guard, bottom, any, any position as, as well as my defense from my boxing when I was training for MMA is really good, deflecting punches, slipping, countering, slipping, clinching, things of that nature. So I started to realize that blending my wrestling, which I wrestled, that was the first thing I did was I started wrestling in high school and college. And then I started doing jujitsu. I started doing sport jujitsu. And then at the same time I was competing in sport jujitsu, I was also doing MMA. So my jujitsu was always a little bit different, regard, you know, already. And then I started adding striking, you know, that was a third part of, of, of the formula. And so then I had the wrestling the striking and the jujitsu all together. And my jujitsu was already a little bit different and more refined for MMA anyways. And that blend is what I call strike-based jujitsu. And um, it is basically a hybrid of Gracie jujitsu um, with the mentality of, of Elio Gracie of, you know, be energy efficient, street applicability and natural body movements, that whole concept with my high school and collegiate wrestling career, as well as uh, the striking I learned when I was doing MMA, which was kickboxing, the Dutch kickboxing system and um, and with boxing footwork. So that whole blend is what strike based jujitsu is. And, and, and I've systematically kind of broken every piece down and then blended it together. It's interesting looking back because Kodokan Judo, which is where Jiu-Jitsu basically came from, didn't incorporate strikes. Mm -hmm. And striking was more mixed in with the Valley Tudo from Brazil. Mm -hmm. So some people say, oh, BJJ is the same thing as Judo. Well, it's really not. Mm -hmm. When it went through Brazil, it got changed a lot. And a lot of sports schools don't emphasize the strikes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't practice with strikes, but that's something that uh, I think would be fun to try. How would you encourage guys to starting to incorporate strikes on the ground? Because obviously you don't want them wearing MMA gloves and pound each other in the face. Um, we do wear MMA gloves, but I think a lot of it stems from the top down. Um, my guys see the way I roll, the way I train, and they're basically, they don't know any difference. So they're just going to basically copy everything I'm doing. So just like with everything else, when you roll with strikes, it's more so to understand when you're in danger and to understand where punches are coming from and kind of what you have to do to neutralize them and control position and manage distance than trying to kill each other. And when you understand that it's more so playing tag, more so than trying to kill your partner, everything changes. And because I can roll with this, such a controlled fashion and be hitting you and not hurting you, my students will automatically emulate that. If I was sitting there cracking everybody really hard, that's exactly what they're going to do. So when you watch even teenagers at my academy roll with strikes, which we do a lot, um, the vast majority of the time, the only reason we're not doing strike rolling right now is because we're training for Gracie Nationals. I'm trying to get my guys ready to understand the differences between rolling with strikes and rolling without. Um, but because of the nature of how to roll with strikes and understanding how to do it, it's completely safe. So I've put little clips on my Instagram of my guys rolling with strikes and you can tell no one's getting hurt, but yet their hands are positioning, they're understanding what things are doing, what they're doing and how to neutralize the strike. So I think the training application and it's the same thing. It's the same concept in striking. And if you go to Thailand and you do kickboxing, they're not trying to kill each other. The guys are really trying to kill each other. The guys here. And I used to do the exact same thing until I started becoming more familiar with striking. Once I understood the game and knowing that I have to get in hit and get out rather than trying to get in as fast as I could and get out as fast as I could understanding that concept, everything changed. My boxing got better, my sparring got better, my partners weren't getting killed as, 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 as much as, as I was doing before because I was just trying to, because I wasn't confident in my setups to get in and get out. It's the same thing rolling with strikes on the ground. If you understand what's possible and what's available to your opponent, you can neutralize it. If you're completely lost and punches are coming at you, guard passes are coming at you, and all these things are coming at you, and you don't understand the philosophy behind what you're doing, then it becomes overwhelming, 
You become scared and you become too defensive and guys start, you know, they hit them with you. They want to hit them back right away Mm -hmm. instead of neutralizing the strike and understanding where it's coming from and understanding position. So I think it's completely safe. And I prefer sparring with MMA gloves rather than not because chances of you getting poked in the eye doing open hand are far higher Mm. if you're rolling without gloves and with. With with gloves, you're tagging the guy, you're tapping him a little bit, and it's not that big of a deal. And again, we're not doing it so much for damage, but for awareness of when and where you can get hit. And that is so key. And that is what is lacking the most out of the vast majority of BJJ schools, as well as the stand-up element. So when we start, very rarely do we start on our knees. Do we start on our knees from time to time? Of course. I mean, some days, I, you know, you know, it's cold. You don't want to be stubbing your toes on takedowns. Yeah, start on your knees today, you guys, no big deal. But the vast majority of times when they have their gloves on, start on your feet because you have to figure out how you're going to go from here to there. How you are going to close that distance without getting hit? And if you're not constantly practicing that, how are you going to expect to be able to do that in a live scenario? Right. And getting back to the strikes, the the limited number of times I've done it, I found that when strikes are included on the ground, it, it creates more openings. The guys Absolutely. aren't just holding tight because they have to open up to be able to throw a punch, and that gives you a chance to triangle or armbar or something. And, uh, and, and on top of that, it's the same on the opposite side as well because a lot of your submissions that – are done with the gi, for example, you have the hand, the collar, you're controlling the arm one way, that's leaving the other hand, if both of your hands are tied up and he has one hand free, then you have, he has one hand to hit you. So my submission game from my back is very strike specific. So there's a lot of things, when I was writing that chapter, chapter, uh, chapter set, no, chapter eight, it's guard bottom, um, I started to realize that a lot of my setups that I was using had to completely delete them, had to completely omit them, because if it wasn't with strikes, I wasn't going to put it in the curriculum. So your whole curriculum at your school is based on jiu-jitsu with strikes? 100% jiu-jitsu with strikes, 100%. There are a couple of chapters where I threw in some bonus techniques where like, hey, guys, you can do this, but don't do it. And it's clearly... Uh, defined and stated, do not do these strikes when the guy's trying to hit you. You can do it for fun when we're playing because I still want them to be experimental and try and, and to learn jujitsu just as a sport as well, slightly. But yeah, I would say 98% of everything in the curriculum, the, you know, the 14, you know, 100, 1400 plus pages in the curriculum that, 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 uh, that I have are all with strikes. So you basically, it sounds like you're teaching jiu-jitsu with strikes almost the whole time but mm-hmm. then when you're getting ready for a tournament you mm-hmm. turn that off and just practice straight grappling do you see a day or do you hope for a day where you can have tournaments with striking on the ground maybe like Eddie Bravo's uh, combat jiu-jitsu I tournament? thought I thought that was a brilliant idea um, but then you're going to have the commission and the whole thing get involved I don't know logistically if it's possible but yes if I would much rather have a submission tournament that incorporates strikes. But now you're talking MMA, you know, now it's a completely different animal. But at the very least, when they hit the ground, if they're using strikes, I mean, that will elevate the jiu-jitsu tremendously. And then all you would have to do is add the, the element of the clinch and the takedown, which is a completely different thing anyways, right. you know. So I think that was Eddie Bravo's idea for a previous event that he had, combat jiu-jitsu. There's yep. no striking on the, on the feet, but once mm-hmm. they hit the ground, then I, they I, I thought it was a brilliant idea. I think that, and Eddie is very misunderstood. What Eddie wants, and the reason Eddie took off the gi initially, was to make jiu-jitsu better for MMA. Yeah. And a lot of people think that he hates jiu-jitsu, he hates the gi, and he said, no, but when you're wearing a gi, you're not going to be able to grab the collar and start attacking chokes for the most part if a guy can hit you. Yeah. And would you do it? And in an MMA context, you're not wearing the gi anyway. So why do we need the gi? And let's get away from the gi a little bit so we can understand how to use underhooks, overhooks, head control, controlling the elbows, the wrist, the head, the, you know, doing it that way because that's the way you're going to do it in an MMA fight. So he's a little bit misunderstood in people thinking that he doesn't like jiu-jitsu. That guy, I, that guy I think likes jiu-jitsu more than I do. He is a <laughs> fanatic about jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, but he wanted it. He didn't want jiu-jitsu to get a bad name in the UFC because guys were so weak at, and didn't have the understanding of how to defend strikes and how to attack submissions with strikes on the ground. Right. And I see you and Eddie have, have a similar idea and that your your focus is really on on preserving the combat effectiveness of jiu-jitsu. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's all I... Everything I do 
is to constantly tweak and modify and make it as efficient as possible. And Elio Gracie laid down an incredible foundation. But for me, as an artist, I feel like my jiu-jitsu is an art. That is an incredible foundation that now I have to build upon that, following his principles. What do you say to the 40-year-old executive that walks mm -hmm. into your academy and says, Javi, look, I don't want to punch anybody. I don't want anybody punching mm -hmm. me. I want to learn jiu-jitsu as a sport, as a way to stay in shape and have fun and, and learn it as an art. Uh, well, I'm very honest. I, I'm not going to tell them something that I don't do. I tell them exactly what we do. I have them try classes and I say, listen, this is what we do. And this is what I'm preparing you for. I think, in all honesty, the vast majority of people that come into the room, that come into the academy, are there to learn self-defense. They don't even know what the sport is. A lot of people, they're like, oh, they do tournaments? I didn't even know. And the vast majority of people watch toys. The reason I got into this is I watched toys in UFC 4, and I wanted to learn that. I wanted to learn how was that guy beating people off of his back? How was a smaller guy being able to beat a bigger guy? How was he able to do that? I didn't get into it for tournaments. I never got into it for tournaments. I competed in tournaments for a long time, and I had a lot of success because of, you know, when I was training with Rodrigo Medeiros, who, who ultimately gave me my black belt under the Carlson Gracie team, that's what we did. It was pressure, 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 pass, 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 control, 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 attack, attack, attack. And that is how I came up learning jiu-jitsu. I didn't have that sense of self-defense until I met Rose. And then I started training with the brothers, and they completely changed my concept and philosophy um, on jiu-jitsu and the approach. It's the same, sub same submissions, the same arms, the same necks. Um, I'm taking the back basically the same way. But the philosophy of how I'm able to finish and my philosophy of time is not really a factor and the philosophy of be patient and neutralize your opponent and defend yourself, that whole concept. I, my, uh, my concept of, of competition, and my concept of defense was the more I'm offensive, the less I have to be on defense. And that is, you know, a lot of people think that way. And that's great. And it worked for me for a very, very long time. But at some point in time, you're going to run into that one person that's going to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, a little more athletic. And then what do you do? You have nothing else to fall back on. At some point, the guy's going to be too big and strong to, to go any further. And then I started thinking, okay, now what do I do? And that happened the first time I trained with Heat on, I threw every attack I had at him. And he just sat there and kind of studied what I was doing. And then when I got exhausted, then he passed me out and tapped me 50 times. And I started realizing, well, I'm like, well, what am I doing wrong? He goes, well, first of all, your defense is terrible. So I had to go back and reconceptualize my entire game and go, okay, I got to assume now that I can't escape them out. Because I just came across a guy that I couldn't escape them out. Past my guard, I couldn't get him back. And I had to understand why that was happening. I had to understand how to change it, and I had to adapt. And ever since then, that's been my whole strategy is I want to learn and do what he on his doing because nobody beats that guy. And I want to be that guy. Henry's the same way. Nobody beats those guys. They're impossible to beat because of the philosophy that they follow. And slowly but surely, I've started to adapt it, and I have become harder and harder to beat as well. That's awesome. You know, uh, earlier in the show, we talked about you joining the Gracie family. And we've seen some people change their last name to Gracie. Has that, has that ever <laughs> that been something you can happen. <laughs> Why is that? Because I, I am an individual. I am, you know, and that's another thing, like some people say, you're a Gracie. Well, I'm not a Gracie, you know, and, and I'm very clear. I'm not delusional in any sense. I am Javier Vasquez and I have the privilege of marrying Rose and being part of the family, but I wasn't born into the family. I wasn't raised a Gracie. And, and for people to, you know, change their name, I think, for me, they lose all individuality. And on top of that, I already had a long list of credentials long before I met Rose. I already had a name long before I met her. I already had a black belt long before I met her. I already had, I was already ranked sixth in the world long before I met her. So for me, what respect do I pay myself and all the achievements and all the work and all the accomplishments that I've done and all the creativity that I've had, if I just say, okay, now I'm a Gracie. Yeah. You know, to me, I want my name to stand 
alone just as strong as everybody else. And I'm not trying to piggyback off of anybody's name and, and, and ride off of anybody's coattails. I'm trying to do it on my own. And will your children, I'm sorry, I don't know if you have kids or not, will their last name be Vasquez? It's Gracie Vasquez. Okay. Gracie so, Vasquez. Best of both worlds. Best of both, you know. All right. So there is an event coming up on February 7th and 8th, and you have uh, a formidable opponent. <laughs> Tell us yes. about that event and who you're facing. So every year, first of all, I want to talk about the submission-only movement. And my wife, Rose, really switch, flipped the switch and has been at the forefront of the submission only movement. And what the difference is, there are basically point tournaments, a variety of point tournaments. Everyone's kind of trying to figure out what that, um, the correct formula for the point tournament is so they're fair. Some people like advantage, some people don't, that whole concept. And then there is the concept of submission only. And the concept of submission only, for me, suits my game at this stage in my life perfectly because the whole concept of jujitsu is to not get tapped and to tap your opponent. When you're training in the gym, you're talking, no one's really keeping track of points. Because if you pass my guard 16 times and I tap you once, you're gonna remember that one time that I tapped you. So the submission has, it's the trump card, it's the e -pone. There's nothing, once I tap you, the match is over. So, and my style of jujitsu was always very aggressive trying to finish. And along the way, I would rack up a tremendous amount of points. And then if I got a little bit tired or I knew I had a tougher guy the next round, I would cross and then I'd win a decision. And if I could push through and finish, I would. But that was always my goal was to finish. And what I've seen recently is now you have very specific types of games that guys are playing for these point tournaments. And now these guys are specialists. Now they're tournament specialists. And... For me, I don't want to be a tournament specialist. I want to be the best guy at finishing ever. That's why you don't see me enter point tournaments because the game I play, maybe I lose on points, but if we go into submissions, chances are I'm going to tap you. And Rose has really been pushing this forward. And the name of the event that we're coming up with right now is Gracie Nationals, which was her first event. And initially, Gracie Nationals was a points event. And when we started making the move to submission only, um, you know, honestly, our attendance dropped because of the switch. But we felt so strongly about the concept and just the overall training of how people are training for jujitsu. They're training for tournaments and they're not training to be the best finisher or have the best defense. They're training, you know, very guard pass heavy, very sweep heavy, very control heavy. But you don't see the amount of submissions that I think you should. There's a variety of reasons. One, because guys are training to sweep, pass, and control. And the other, because of the time. The amount of time that you have, five, six, seven, eight, or ten minutes, some guys, two very equally matched guys, it's going to be tough, and now it comes down to the points. And a lot of guys, what I've started to realize is that they really don't even care about submissions. If they get it, great, but they're not really dialing in their submission game. They are more so like, okay, I'm just going to control points and cruise and win. Oh, I'm a world champion. Okay, cool. That's great. And there is a tremendous amount of skill and strategy that, that goes along with that. But that was never my goal. So my goal was always to be the best finisher and to be un, unable to be finished. So um, that is the divide that I choose to do the submission only format, because now we're going to find out who's jujitsu's best to finish. And I have a match coming up on February 8th, which is the Nogi Day of Gracie Nationals against a pretty good guy, Gary Tonin, who's, who's been um, doing exceptionally well. And um, I didn't even know who Gary Tonin was 
a month ago, three weeks ago. I had no idea who the guy was. I had seen a guy that gave Crone Gracie a tough match at Abu Dhabi, but I didn't put two and two together. And I was having a conversation with Eddie Bravo, and I say, hey, Eddie, um, you know, I want to get a match, but I want a tough match. I want a guy that I feel can tap me, or I feel at the very least can put me in danger of being tapped. And um, I, for me to do matches against, you know, your average guy, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't excite me. I need to be motivated at this stage in my life and at my career. I need to be motivated to get into the room and train and to do something. Um, so I asked, I'm like, Eddie, who's the good guy? Who do you think? No, I, that's not even what I said. I, what I said was, who do you think I should pair up with? He said, Gary Tonin. I said, who the hell is that? <laughs> First thing I said, I said, who's that? So he said, oh, he's really good. He's this. He won EBI. He had a good, great fight with Crone. And, um, you know, he did Metamorris. And, and that's, I think, the first time I saw him. He went against Kid Dale and Metamorris. That's the first time I saw him, which was how long ago? Maybe a couple months ago. Yeah. But again, it didn't resonate. I saw the match, but it didn't resonate. And um, I said, great. And then when I started to do my research on him, man, he's really, really good. He's a tremendously talented guy. And I have my hands full. There's no question about it. But that's just the way I like it. I want to be pushed. And I want to be, you know, if you're going to go after somebody, why would you go after the guy at the bottom, bottom of the rung? I want to, I want to, I, my mentality is always to be the best. So if I want to be the best or considered at the very least at the elite level, I'm going to go with guys at the elite level. And what so, is the time length, length on this match? There's no time. no time. So either I'm going to tap or he's going to tap. Chances are it's probably going to be him. Right. Um, but he's got a tremendously dangerous game. He's fantastic from the back. He's got great Kimuras. He's got uh, a very unorthodox style. He's got fantastic leg locks. So he's got a very well-rounded finishing style game. He takes chances um, to, 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 you know, he takes unorthodox chances yep. and he takes those chances so much that for me, maybe it's a position that I'm not very familiar with or for his opponents, but he's very comfortable in that game. And that is what makes people dangerous. That's what made the 10th Planet guys so dangerous is that they know something that you don't and you're falling in the hole and you don't even know you're in the hole right. until it's too late. So that seems to be what's happening with him with his leg locks is that he knows the game, the transitional game very, very well and guys get lost in the transition and boom, then he catches you. So... He's a very dangerous opponent, and, and that's exactly the kind of guy I wanted. Yeah, it'll be a fun match to watch. Yeah, I mean, and I've gotten a, a, a lot of feedback, and it's this whole thing. I'm with Javi, I'm, I'm with Gary, and this whole mm -hmm. divide and, and this excitement. And, and, and I honestly just wanted a tough match, and I just threw it out there, and, and it's gotten a lot of traction, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very exciting. Cool. I mean, let me let's let me ask you a couple questions about submission only tournaments because mm -hmm. um, there's some things that maybe uh, maybe I don't understand completely. But one is the term submission only. Mm -hmm. uh, to the layperson, that sounds like you're going to see a submission in every match. Correct. But that's not the case because there's a time limit. So mm -hmm. a submission only event, uh, there's no guarantee that there's going to be any more submissions than a points tournament. Mm -hmm. um, to me, a true submission only event has no time limits Correct. like your match with Gary. Mm -hmm. But when when you have a tournament with maybe a hundreds or thousands of competitors, mm -hmm. that's just not possible. Logistics. Right. Yeah. Um, well, our tournament's a little bit different because people assume that there has to be a winner. And the second that you allow a criteria of any kind, whether it's points, whether it's an advantage, whether it's submission attempts, whether it's lock submission attempts, whatever the case may be, whatever criteria you want to create Competitors are smart. They will always take the path of least resistance to win. When you cut out the criteria and you only make it submissions, the mentality of the competitor completely changes. Now, they're going to take those chances that they might have not taken in a point tournament because they don't care if you pass your guard. That's not the, I'll take that risk because my defense is so good. I'll take that risk to try and catch you. And we have a tremendous amount of submissions. And the other thing, too, guys change the way they train. So now they have to dial in their submissions. They have to dial in their submission attempts. They have to dial in their setups. They have to dial in their conditioning because our matches are 15 minutes in the qualifiers. Now, in the finals, it's unlimited time. But logistics, yeah, you're right. If you do, you know, 
uh, uh, submission only, true submission only with no time limit, it's going to take you 16 days to get through a tournament. Right. But so we had to kind of draw a line in the 15 minutes. Now, at the end of 15 minutes, let's say I'm rolling with you and we go 15 minutes and there's no winner, no submission. We're both out. So knowing that you're not going to get to that next round unless you tap me will change your mentality. And now the matches at Gracie Nationals and Gracie Worlds and Gracie Regionals, they don't slow down as time goes on. They ramp up. So the matches become far more, user, uh, far more exciting to watch. They're much easier. If you're a spectator in the crowd, far easier to follow the matches. This guy's standing up. There's probably not going to be a submission. This guy here is in the guard. Nothing there. Side mount. I'll keep an eye on this one. This guy here. Oh, this guy's got the arm under. This guy's going. This guy can catch him. So now you're going to pay attention as a spectator to which match is close to being finished. It doesn't matter what the score is. There's no score. They're only looking at the potential of finish. So now as a spectator, you have six or eight mats, however mats you have. And now you can kind of scan... This guy's close. And then you start watching that because that's what people really want to look for is the finish. I mean, the setup, the transition, you know, that's great. That's nice. But ultimately, what's exciting about jiu-jitsu, what's exciting about MMA is the finish and the potential for finish and the danger. Oh, God, the guy's arms like that. You're going to get out. Ah, he got out. Wow, that's really cool. That's what makes it exciting. So... You know, most point matches, you got to kind of watch. Okay, who's winning? Because oh, I can't see the scoreboard. Who's winning? Oh, man. You got to kind of pay attention. And then you lose out or miss out on what else is going on. So um, we do have 15-minute qualifiers. There's no question about it. But if you don't qualify, you're both out. And if everyone's out in the first round, then there's no winner. Let me ask you about that. And, and let me preface this by saying I think it's cool with new, new different kinds of rules. It makes mm -hmm. for different things, different uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. But let's say hypothetically we have a four-man division. It's me, uh, one of the cameramen uh, behind the, the camera, mm -hmm. and you and Gary Tonin. Mm -hmm. So anybody looking at that four-man division sit, would say that you or Gary should win that. Mm -hmm. um, but now you and Gary roll, and, and there's no submission, so mm -hmm. you're both out. Mm -hmm. And then I beat the cameraman. Now I won. Exactly. That, that does not prove – that does not – the guy that should have won that division didn't win. Yeah, but there's a lot of times that guys that should win divisions don't. Sometimes they get injured. Oops. Sometimes they get injured. Sometimes it's a bad call. Sometimes he just has a bad day. That's just the way things are. Now, generally, if you have two high-profile guys, of course we try to separate them. Of course. But if you're an up-and-comer, you're going to have to face that guy at some point. And you're going to have to tap him at some point. And most, for most people, 15 minutes seems like an eternity. 15 minutes to me is, okay, we're warming up. I'm starting to figure you out. I got a little sweat going, and we're starting to work. Depending on how you approach the match. And have we had that? Yes, we've had that. But say, for example, we have a rule called the wild card rule because what would happen is let's say you have an eight-man bracket and only three guys submit in advance. So now you have three guys left. And now it's a three-man bracket. Now you're going to do round robin, and it, it becomes a little bit difficult because now it just takes longer to get to that finals. So what I do is all of the guys, the guys who were left and um, were not submitted. If you're submitted, you're out. But the guys who went to that decision, now basically we do like a random draw, and then that fourth guy gets brought in, and now again you have a four-man bracket. Mm -hmm. So we tried to, to, to compromise, but yeah, it is possible that everybody, nobody gets a submission, everyone goes to the bracket, no submission, no winner. Because okay. we want the focus to be for you to leave that turn and be like, man, I didn't advance, but nobody won. I've got to get my submissions better. There's only one way to win. So it's really putting the competitor and painting them into a corner and saying, look, you have to get better at submissions. Whatever submission that is, you have to get better. And that's almost strong arming people into making their jujitsu better, which is what they're supposed to be doing anyways, and right. making their finishes better, which is what they're supposed to be doing anyways, and making their defense better, which is what they're supposed to be doing anyways. So uh, for me, it's very extreme. People say, man, it's too extreme. And, and I've had that question asked a million times. And what I say is, they better figure out how to finish. And we've had matches go upwards of an hour and 46 minutes with 
the rafters being pulled down, banners being mm-hmm. pulled down. Um, oopsie. Uh, what are they called? The forklifts pulling in, mm-hmm. putting everything down. And people and Rose is like, Hav, we have to stop this. I'm like, <laughs> someone's going to tap. Someone's going to give up. An hour and 46 minutes, someone's going to crack. Because the guy who wins, there's no other feeling that's going to be more intense than that because he earned it. An hour and 46 minutes and you finish the guy, there's nothing like it. And people go bananas. And you walk away and it's just a different sense of pride when you have to tap everyone in your division to be the champion. It's just a completely different experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's uh, it's a misnomer to think that some people don't want to see submissions. Everybody wants of to course. see submissions. And, and all the organizations in the world are trying to see how they can incentivize it, how they can get to, get to more submissions. Mm-hmm. And But I also just want to say for maybe the people that don't understand, for the points tournaments, nobody – would rather win on points than a submission, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that the points tournaments do is by incentivizing a knee on belly for Mm -hmm. getting two points, you don't want the guy to score, so you're going to be actively pushing his knee off, and Mm -hmm. that's exposing your arm for the arm bar. So there's some cases where points tournaments can actually encourage more submissions, but there's also the other flip side where people will hold uh, to win as well. So uh, I think it's cool that all these different people are doing different things, Mm -hmm. and uh, can't wait to see your tournament, and and great luck against uh, Gary. That's going to be a super exciting match. Are you practicing your foot lock defenses? No, 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 I haven't... uh... No, does he do for luck? <laughs> no, I, I mean, um, like I said, I, I felt very privileged in the position where I'm at, and I've been around for so long that I have access to whoever yeah. I need. And, the, you know, they're personal friends of mine or they're friends with Rose, and, and I have that connection. But I call Dean Lister. I've known Dean for many, many years. He tends to be pretty good with footlocks. People tend to regard him as pretty good with footlocks. And the way I figured it is, if he's that good at footlocks, he has to be good at defending footlocks, which he is. He's got a, a, an amazing system that he does. Um, and uh, so I went to Dean. I hung out with Dean. I've trained with Jeff Glover. He's down there. He's fantastic at attacking leg locks from all kinds of angles. And um, training with Dean's guys, Dean's best guys. So is he going to catch me with a leg lock? Who knows? I, I, I don't know. I can't predict the future. But I am feeling uh, like that window of opportunity for him is getting smaller and smaller every single day. And if he can't beat me, at some point, I'm going to beat him. There's no question about it. Awesome. Can't wait for it. Thank you so much. All right. Let's go to the mats, guys. The second he, it happens, when he goes to hit me, sucker punch, you're already blocking. So I pass it by, grip, and glue. As he goes to rip away, look, I just go with him. How nice of you, Jake, to help me out. 